chainsaws are big boy toys. In timber sports, they become extreme pieces of sports equipment. Holding 70 horsepower and handling it very precisely is not without its challenges. A passion for chainsaws. Some woodcutters love their tools so much, they even set up a chainsaw museum in their free time. This is a really nice piece of work, yeah. Chainsaws are lifesavers. Very special models are used to free people who are trapped. I can saw special materials, bulletproof glass, for example. I can cut steel, and I can cut through nails quite easily. The chainsaw success story. They were invented in Germany, and today, the world market leader is still based in Baden-Württemberg. Winterberg in North Rhine-Westphalia. The German woodcutting championship is taking place here today. It goes by the name of Timber Sports. Here, chainsaws are sports equipment. And this guy is one of the big names in the scene, Robert Ebner. The 31-year-old is already German champion many times over. I cut a world record with this saw this year, so three slices, 46 centimeters in diameter, in 5.23. A time like that would, of course, be fantastic today. This saw is made only for sports. Custom built, weighs 30 kilos, chain speed of 300 kilometers an hour. Actually, everything is self-built, and yes, it's all designed for speed. Robert Ebner has been a regular favorite at national and international championships for 10 years now. His toughest competitor, Dirk Braun, reigning German champion and therefore defender of the title. I have what it takes to be German champion. If I could win an eighth title, that would be fantastic. It's quite simple, doubters never win, winners never doubt. What are we doing first, the big one or the small one? Before the competition begins, the athletes' chainsaws are carefully checked once again to make sure that the self-built machines comply with safety regulations. Because in the hot saw discipline, the saws are all modified custom products and therefore bursting with power. Unlike commercially available models with five to a maximum of 10 horsepower, the hot saws deliver an impressive 60 to 70 horsepower as much as some small cars. The athletes have to give it all they've got because holding 70 horsepower and handling it very precisely is not without its challenges. The 10 best German athletes are here and they've got to have what it takes, and they do. This means years of training with the chainsaw. Dirk Braun has been training four times a week for 13 years. That should pay off today. There's a competitive spirit between us. It's obvious that everyone wants to win. Robert's performance this year has been average. I'd say not top form. So we'll see how it goes. There's 20 years difference between us, so we'll have to see how it goes today. Not all the athletes have so much experience under their belts. Stefan Otvaka is a newcomer. Timber sports are a real adventure for him. When you cut with a hot saw for the first time, it's loud, it vibrates in your hand, it's heavy, it stinks, but it's heaps of fun. <laughs> the chain speed of this hot saw is 240 kilometers per hour. Its weight, around 30 kilograms, which means this saw is not suitable for working in the forest. It's purely a piece of sports equipment. The saw has no cooling system and would break right away if the cut took longer. For us, the cuts can only take between six and eight seconds, and then you have to turn the saw off so it can cool down again. Otherwise, if it were running longer, it would overheat and break. Without expertise and practice, handling these machines is extremely dangerous. So that nothing goes wrong, only professionals who know what they're doing and how to protect themselves are allowed to participate in timber sports. I know exactly what I'm doing. There's a lot of training involved. 
We also have these individual training camps and the coaches say, OK, you can take one more step. You can do standing. It's always watched closely, always introduced very slowly. And whether I hurt myself or not is always under my control. Special protective clothing is mandatory at the German Timber Sports Championship. If you don't wear it, you're automatically disqualified. For the soaring disciplines, we have chainsaw pants and safety glasses, and of course, ear protectors. You definitely need those. Before the athletes go on stage, they're briefed. The referees explain the rules of the competition again. There are six disciplines in total, two of which are with the chainsaw. The other disciplines are performed with axes or a crosscut saw. In each of the disciplines, speed is of the essence. And this requires not only strength, but also concentration and precision. You can score 10 points in each discipline. If you get a DQ, then that's zero points. A DQ means a disqualification. Nobody here wants that. The tension is rising. Around 2,000 spectators have already gathered in front of the stage. Although timber sports originally came from the USA, a fan community has since developed in Germany. Newcomer Stefan Odvaka is getting ready for the stock saw. Here, athletes have to cut two slices of a log as evenly as possible, using a downward motion followed by an upward cut, a maximum of 10 centimeters in total. At 12.38 seconds, Odvaka is far from a new record time. The wood was a bit unusual. I pressed a bit too hard. If you press too hard, the machine speed drops, the chain takes out less wood, and you need more time for the cut. And that, no doubt, just cost me 1.5 seconds for my best time, which is a lot in this discipline. Will things go better for the chainsaw champions? Defending champion Dirk Braun is already warming up, and his toughest competitor, Robert Ebner, is also getting ready for the stock saw. It's all or nothing now, more or less. There's a lot you can do wrong. I hope I can repeat my times from previous cups, and then we'll see. But right now, I have to get up there. The tension is high. Almost everything in the athletes' lives revolves around the sharp, loud machines. Chainsaws are an absolute passion. That's what connects the athletes. But now it's time for... In the competition, two athletes always go head-to-head -head against each other. Before sawing off two slices, both hands must be placed on the wood until the starting signal. The two favorites are only a hundredth of a second apart. Sawing in the same time like this is rare, so the times are checked again backstage. Camera images will now decide who was really faster on the stock saw. So, gentlemen, both cuts good. Both results are valid, but Dirk Braun was faster. I thought I was faster. I thought he was still soaring back there. But in the end, it wasn't like that. I don't have eyes in the back of my head. That was wishful thinking. No, Dirk is now one point ahead. I'm in third. The camera images proved that Robert Ebner was a touch slower. But the sportsman takes it with pride. So close, it was damn close. But yes, that's how it goes. Now I'm two points behind on the stock saw. Dirk is one point ahead. Now we'll just have to see how it goes. 
Defending champion Dirk Braun, on the other hand, is happy that he was able to beat the younger competitor once again. The old guys in front, that's right. You know, it's nice to wind up the boys a bit at my age. And next, the hot saw duel. Who will be the German champion in the end? Eight o'clock in the morning in a forest in Schleswig-Holstein. Lumberjack Jan Mathiesen and his employees are to clear an area of forest. Thanks to the powerful chainsaws, the woodcutter only needs two men for the job, although they will be felling dozens of trees. There used to be far more people in the crew. Today there are two, definitely two, no less than two people. When I was an apprentice, my boss told me that in the 1950s, there used to be almost 25 men in the forest. When it comes to clearing, it's all about quantity for the forest worker. No complicated individual felling. Areas are cleared in a matter of minutes. We get paid for the amount we clear, so I only get paid for the trees I actually put aside. In this case, the chainsaws are going to make short work of a coniferous forest. All the larch trees will disappear from an area of forest of several square kilometers. The customer for the clearing is an environmental protection organization. What's that all about? This is a switch from coniferous wood to deciduous wood. The aim of these environmental organizations is to do away with any coniferous wood here because deciduous forests are typical for Schleswig-Holstein and larches simply don't belong here. This isn't their natural habitat. So there's only one thing for it. The conifers have to go. Deciduous trees are already sprouting underneath and enjoying the new sunlight. The larches, on the other hand, will be harvested like ripe corn in a field. To do this, Matizen first cuts off the side parts at the root. To make the trunk a bit narrower at the bottom for felling and, for example, so that it fits into the peeling machine at the sawmill, I have to cut off these elephant ears at the bottom. Within seconds, the chainsaw cuts a wedge into the trunk, determining the direction the larch is going to fall. I have to sharpen the saw after all. It's not quite 100% sharp. Like a bicycle chain, chainsaws for forest use consist of links driven by a sprocket. At the top are the steel teeth that plane off the wood. Chainsaws should therefore actually be called chain planes. All of this happens in a fraction of a second. With a sharp chain, there's nothing standing in the way of the forest clearing. Here, you can see why chainsaw enthusiasts, like Jan Matissen, affectionately call their tools spruce mopeds. The chainsaws sweep through the forest at breakneck speed. What has taken decades to grow is felled in seconds. I'll pre-cut the other two, then you can debranch this one. For clearing operations like this one, small all-round chainsaws are the tool of choice. For the sawing professional, they have to meet certain criteria. It has to be powerful, powerful enough, but also not too heavy, because you have to carry every extra pound or every ounce around with you all day. That's the problem. That's why Lumberjack Matissen prefers straightforward old saws to modern high-tech models. Of course, the global market leader for chainsaws is of a different opinion. Filming is strictly prohibited here, but we're given a special permit. The factory in Weiblingen, Baden-Württemberg is high tech. Fully automated forklift trucks operate driveless and computers control the feed of components to the assembly line workers. The first step in the production of a chainsaw is the marriage between the crankshaft and the housing. 
Production manager Sven Hellerich is the man in charge. This here is our crankshaft. It consists of a piston, the two-piece crankshaft, all our own parts. It's made here in the factory a few kilometers from here in Weiblingen. The sides both come from our manufacturing plant in Krüm and the piston from our plant in Virginia Beach in the United States. Next, an employee assembles the heart of the machine, the 50cc cylinder that ensures 4.1 horsepower. But people only pre-assemble here. Next comes the inspection by a testing robot, because people are fallible. We check the tightness of the machine by closing all the relevant openings and applying pressure. The pressure must be maintained for a certain time. It's very important that we have a clean contact surface here that is completely tight. A person wouldn't be able to test this. The next station is where the special electronic ignition is installed because a chainsaw has to start reliably, no matter what the weather's like. This ring, the centrifugal clutch, is also special. Without it, the saw chain would already rotate while idling. But only when you hit the throttle do the weights shift outwards and the clutch engages. Before the next computer check, an employee installs the anti-vibration handle. Without this, lumberjacks wouldn't be able to saw for any prolonged length of time. The last thing is the carburetor. Incidentally, the world market leader also supplies these to its competitors. So most chainsaws worldwide have the same model installed. Slowly, a saw emerges. You can already see that the whole thing will make a saw. The handle housing is already assembled. The hand guard is there. The carburetor and the carburetor holder are there. Next is the test station where all safety critical features are checked one more time for completeness so that we're certain they work properly. Once again, a computer checks the work of a human. The chainsaw is photographed from all sides and the images are compared within fractions of a second. There's control software behind this, which checks each feature again individually and makes sure, is every part present? Is it in the right place? Has everything been installed correctly? So that we can be sure that everything will work. But the supreme discipline of all computer checks is yet to come. Barely finished with the final touches made by people in this high-tech factory. And then each saw is placed individually in a special test box, developed specially by the company. Here, the saw is started up for the first time. Then the robot checks all functions. The quick stop chain brake is tested here, clutch engagement and coupling speeds are tested, and the machine is operated at a certain interval, warmed up once, then certain performance cases are tested. If everything works, the saw responds with a sequence of speeds. It plays a melody. The chainsaws of this German company are sold in over 160 countries. But the number of units the company produces is top secret. After the last inspection stamp, it goes into the box, but without the blade. The new owner buys this separately in the exact length they require. Back in Schleswig-Holstein, Lumberjack Jan Mattison is not only a lumberjack, but also a chainsaw expert. His collection has grown so large that he has turned it into a chainsaw museum with 500 items. In the collector scene, the father of two has long been considered the chainsaw king, but even a monarch has his favorites. This is one of my favorite pieces. Somebody gave it to me as a gift, so I treasure it very much. It's a very, very large tree-logging chainsaw. A bit outdated, but it was still built for export well into the 90s. And this is a really nice piece of work. You can really say that. Jan Mattisen bought his first chainsaw more than 30 years ago. And it was then that he caught the collecting bug. There is no model, no collector's item that would not find a place in his museum. 
This is something very special. It's a homemade model from the former GDR. This is a moped engine from a Simpson moped, where they basically just added a cutting attachment and built a rather bizarre exhaust. The throttle is just like a moped. It's quite a feat of craftsmanship, I'd say, to build something like that. But it's also only suitable for cutting. It can't be tilted to the side because the carburetor is not designed to be swiveled. The enthusiast finds his exhibits all over the world. There are Russian chainsaws called druzhba. Druzhba means friendship. These saws have a slightly different shape to those we're familiar with. They're held like this for cutting. For lumbering, you could also tilt the cutting attachment like this. There are companies today that even equip modern saws with handles like this for Eastern Europe, for Russia. Most of these chainsaws work. The collector has repaired many of them himself. The vintage saws are no longer suitable for day-to-day -day work. That's why Jan Matisen fires them up every now and then in his spare time. As a lumberjack, he always has enough wood in stock. This is a Dolma CT, the biggest saw Dolma built in the 60s. What's special about this saw is that it has a wraparound handle which runs all the way around the saw, and it has a powerful engine with 8 horsepower and 120 cubic centimeters, which you'll hear right away. Matisen's vintage chainsaws have enough to do, even if the collector can't deny the advantage of modern saws. If you work with this one for a while, you feel it in your fingers because it doesn't have an anti-vibration handle. You still feel the full vibration in your fingers. With longer use, you can develop circulation problems in your fingers, which is called hand-arm vibration syndrome. So for a moment, it's okay, but not for a long time. The world's largest manufacturer of chainsaws is also familiar with this phenomenon. It has a research department dedicated to studying vibration. I've seen pictures of hand-arm vibration syndrome where the fingers are very misshapen and colorless, in other words, bloodless, so they can't be moved properly. And then, of course, the lumberjack is out of a job. This has been proven to be caused by vibrations. In the past, the first chainsaws did not have an anti-vibration system, so it went directly from the engine into your hand. At the end of the 70s, the problem was finally brought under control with special handles that softened the vibrations. Today, these anti-vibration handles are installed by every manufacturer worldwide. Nevertheless, the manufacturers continue to research looking for better, more effective solutions. But these actually already existed in the 70s. Simply use a combustion engine that hardly generates any vibrations. This is a Vankel engine, a rotary piston engine, which was a really great development. It was also used in cars and things like that, but was ahead of its time. In the Vankel engine, the piston rotates in a circle rather than moving up and down. The saw sounds odd, but doesn't vibrate anywhere near as much. And then there's this 19 kilo monster. This is an old steel BL, the first one-man saw that Steel built. Now I have to move the starting cord to fire it up. It hasn't been started up yet to test it. Let's see. Yes, it starts incredibly well. A large volume engine of 125 cubic centimeters, intact ignition, and with a drop of fuel and the starting cord, the little gem gets up and running. Not bad at all. Although, of course, the machine's design is now completely outdated. Theoretically, you could still work with a saw like this today, but of course it doesn't have the safety features modern saws have. Like this machine, for example, which also has a quick-stop chain brake. With this release lever, which is here at the top of the saw, the machine activates the brake the moment it jumps towards me and I hit it with my wrist or the ball of my hand. And this happens in a fraction of a second. 
In practice, it looks like this. The chain stands still. It was developed in the late 60s, early 70s, and it's a very good thing because there used to be a lot of injuries caused by this kickback effect. Jan Matisen is well known throughout the chainsaw collector scene. His collection keeps growing and growing. The king of collectors is always on the lookout for more exhibits. People now even contact him with items they found in their attics or sheds. Because I've occasionally been in the newspaper with my collection and also exhibit my saws at vintage saw events and show people that there's someone who collects these things, people are calling me more often and saying they've found something and asking whether I would be interested. I always say, I'll come by and take a look. The chainsaw fan doesn't know what awaits him today. The woman who called me said she'd found an old chainsaw and that it was yellow, and that's all I know. Based on the color, I can roughly deduce what make it could be, but I don't know exactly, you just never know. Matisen doesn't buy his chainsaws online, only directly in person. He's happy to make the journeys. People now say he knows every chainsaw in the region personally, but new models pop up all the time. Hello? Hello. Hello. We spoke on the phone about the old saw. Hello. Hello. Yes, I found a saw here in my woodshed, and I read about your chainsaw museum and thought maybe it would be something for you. The family only recently bought the house. An elderly man who worked in the forest used to live here, and we were digging around in the wood and actually wanted to stack it up a bit. Here's the treasure. I'd say that's an old partner. A partner C6, probably. Something like that. It's from the early 50s. Very interesting. It's also almost intact. The only thing missing that I can see now is an air filter cover. But otherwise, there's also a rail. The saw is special because it's a very old saw from the early 50s. These were hardly ever sold in Germany. I think it was probably brought to Germany from Scandinavia. Because I don't think that anyone in Germany sold these saws. So it's definitely quite a rare saw for Germany. Matisen brings the uncovered treasure into the sunlight. The vintage saw is dirty and encrusted. It was probably lying in the shed for decades. At least the joints can still be moved. What price would you have in mind if you wanted to sell it? Or do you even want to sell it at all? Actually, I wouldn't want to sell it, because we heat almost exclusively with wood. And I know that you work in the forest. Maybe we could swap it for a load of firewood or something. Yes, we could also do something like that. You can put it in your museum, and we get a load of winter firewood in return. Yeah, for example, that would be a possibility. Sounds good. Well, have fun with it, and I'll try to get to the museum with the girls. Yes, that would be nice. Just drop by, and I'll get back to you about the wood. It's a deal, then. Thanks, bye-bye. Once repaired, the rare find from 1956 would cost at least 800 euros at collector's markets. They're not that common on eBay, for example, and I'm not someone who buys online either. I prefer to buy in person from people and sometimes hear a story about the machine. That's always a nicer encounter. At home, Jan Matisen is eager to try out the machine. Only then will it become clear whether he has acquired a pile of scrap or a treasure whose clattering sound will make his fellow collectors green with envy. I don't think it's been used for a long time. It has about four horsepower and 100 cubic centimeters, a very heavy machine, but it makes a very decent impression. I think I can bring it back to life with a few simple steps. The technology, especially that of old chainsaws, is simple and, at least in theory, easy to repair if you have the right spare parts. 
at least the starter produces an ignition spark, and the correct spare parts are quickly found. Look here, an air filter. There's still a cover on the gearbox. Exactly, these are donor devices. I can replace the missing oil cap, for example. It fits. It's often the same parts that are missing. It's always the parts that are easy to unscrew that get lost over time. Or plastic and rubber lids are often eaten away completely by mice. Quite often with the newer modern saws using vegetable chain oil, I've had someone come to me and say their saw is broken because the oil is dripping out. And then I've seen that the lid of the oil tank has been eaten away because the mice want the oil. The Swedish company from the 50s has since disappeared from the market and the few remaining items are highly sought after among collectors. Because Scandinavian technology from the 50s is considered indestructible. After all, the machines were built for extremely cold weather. You can say that with the old machines, as long as you have a spark left and there is still somehow a drop of petrol in the system, you usually have a chance that they will at least still run. Whether they run well is another matter, but at least they make some kind of noise. So let's take it outside and put a bit of petrol in it. There seems to be a bit left in there, but it's not much. And above all, no one knows how old it is. For the collector, the moment of truth has come. Every machine tells a story. This old Swedish saw is based on a German design. But in the 50s, Swedes and Norwegians did not want to import technology from Germany. Instead, they developed their own models based on well-known designs. The vintage saw has trouble starting. The problem will be that something is clogged and stopping the fuel from going through. A few flicks of the wrist get the fuel flowing. And indeed, the antique machine works. What a piece of work. But it's running, so that's a good thing. I'm happy. I made it a hole again in a few easy steps and got it running. That's great, a nice piece for my collection. So now, chainsaw collector and forest worker Jan Mattisen is the proud exhibitor of 501 chainsaws. Back at the German Timber Sports Championship. This has nothing to do with work in the forest. This is purely about the fun of sawing. The favorite, Robert Ebna, is competing against nine other athletes, including defending champion Dirk Braun and newcomer Stefan Odvaka. Everyone here is a real pro with the chainsaw. Preparations for the supreme discipline are already in full swing. In the hot saw contest, only custom products are used. Modified chainsaws with up to 70 horsepower. At such high speeds, the chain can jump off from time to time and fly one or two meters. That's why we have the plexiglass shields. When operating the hot saw, hardly anything is predictable. Here, when everyone has their own saws, you never know what's going to happen. Will the saw start? Will it not start? Will the chain jump off? Will everything work? Is the other athlete better? So here we go. Real men and real monster machines. Testosterone levels couldn't get any higher. And the noise is not for the faint-hearted either. At up to 130 decibels, the modified chainsaws clatter louder than most motorbikes. Stefan Odvaka's chainsaw is also custom made and therefore anything but an ordinary lumberjack saw. All the parts come from racing. We have an open sports air filter here, we have a special ignition system here, 
We have a homemade exhaust system tuned to the engine. A lot of work and attention to detail goes into the hot saws. As a master car mechanic, Odvaka works on his machine himself to get the best possible performance out of it. Now, it's time for the chainsaw to show what it can do. Because Stefan Odvaka is currently in last place, he now has to go all in. I'm giving it full throttle now. Now, of course, everyone gives it full throttle when cutting, but a lot of people release the throttle during the changeover to do it safely, and then go full throttle again for the cut. I'm going to stay on it and try and do it in one go to save time. But it's riskier because then the saw becomes unstable. Will this risk pay off? The 32-year-old is a beginner among the athletes. Today, he wants to prove that he has potential. In the hot saw discipline, the athletes have to cut three slices from the log as evenly as possible, a maximum of 15 centimeters in total. This calls for strength and concentration in equal measure. His competitor has already finished sawing, and Stefan Odvaka's saw hasn't even started. Unfortunately, not a successful cut for the newcomer today. He's extremely disappointed, but the self-made chainsaws are often unpredictable. No luck in the hot saw again. I pulled the cord, it didn't start, so I had to wind up the starting cord again, had to pull it again. I made three cuts, which were great, but because the saw didn't start, I lost time and only got two points. This is not a crisis area. It's the federal training ground of the THW, the Federal Agency for Technical Relief in Baden-Württemberg. Helpers from all over Germany practice for disasters here. The purpose of this area is to create a realistic scenario for the trainees during the exercises, either an earthquake or a gas explosion. And we don't just have a flat area and say, imagine this or that were here. Time and again, the THW is active around the world rescuing people who are trapped. The organization has special tools for this, including this rescue saw. I have a special chain on it. I can saw special materials, bulletproof glass, for example. I can cut steel and so on up to certain sizes. I can cut through nails quite easily. I can predefine a certain cutting depth so I don't go too deep into the material and can only cut through my material without hurting anything behind it. Today, the team is testing a new saw in extreme situations. The fictitious scenario is an ICE train crash. The passengers are trapped. The THW team puts on protective clothing and face masks. Because in the exercise, they have to cut their way through obstacles made of bulletproof glass. Bulletproof glass is one of the most complicated things to cut. We don't come across it so often in the field, but a similar hardness is found, for example, on railway trains, ICE windows, or similar. This creates a lot of glass splinters and glass dust, so we wear additional protective goggles and a protective mask so that the splinters don't get into our eyes or respiratory tract. ICEs have special glass windows that have to withstand enormous pressure differences when entering tunnels. Like bulletproof glass, the window consists of several layers of glass with safety films between them. These protect against pressure differences, as well as bullets or explosions. Slowly, the six horsepower monster saw cuts its way through the bulletproof glass. The saw's special chain is made of carbide produced in Switzerland. This is sharpened with diamonds in the factory. Sawable materials? Anything. Whether it's an entrance hole for helpers or smoke extraction in fires, this saw must never give up, or people could die. A rescue saw is therefore a crucial part of all THW disaster equipment. Yes, the corner is cut out perfectly. 
Viereck ist einwandfrei rausgekommen. You can see here that the glass is flaked off due to the enormous forces that occur during soaring. If you look at this piece and then take a look at the chain, you'll see that you should manage a good 2 to 2.5 running meters with the saw. But then it will have reached its wear limit, which means you would need a new chain. As a rule, you can't resharpen it because there are such high forces in play that individual teeth can fly off. This means that if the chain has really reached its wear limit, then we need a new one. Scenario 2. An earthquake. People trapped in the ruins. The team of THW specialists applies the rescue saw to the bricks. The rescue saw really is an all-round tool. It's not meant for this, but it works. The reason for the mission could be inaccessible wreckage and ruins where only a few tools are available to the helpers while they work. This was the case, for example, after the 2015 earthquake in Nepal. More than 20,000 people were buried within minutes and decades of infrastructure were destroyed. The German THW was on the ground for months. With the rescue chainsaw, teams can cut holes in the brickwork to get inside, take care of those buried, or simply get air to people trapped inside. Yeah, the cutting result was good. You can see it's cleanly cut through. So for an emergency, to get in really quickly if you don't have any other useful tool with you, it's definitely an alternative. However, the expensive special chain has been destroyed for good in the process. The chain is of course ruined now after such extreme exposure to dust, so it really is a disposable item. But in the field, when it comes to saving lives, that's just the way it is. Because the Federal Agency for Technical Relief could be back in action in Germany or anywhere in the world tomorrow. Eight o'clock in the morning in Schleswig-Holstein. Today, lumberjack and chainsaw collector Jan Mattison is going to cut down an oak tree that is threatening a country road. The difficulty is cutting the tree in such a way that it doesn't fall onto the road. We'll do this with the help of a winch, and I'm now just looking for a fixed point where we can attach a pulley so that we can fell the tree so it falls parallel to the road. A part of the crown broke off here once. It was a split oak, and the stability is just a bit worrying, because when the tree splits open, fungi can grow in it very quickly, which then weakens the tree. And that could endanger people's lives. The owner of the property is liable for the trees. They would be responsible for damage to the road or even injury to people. The oak tree, therefore, has a future as firewood. Yes, through there, that's it. And then back there at the oak, the second one, before the alder already. No, here, in front of the first tree. Exactly. Even though these tools play a central role in the work, it's another piece of equipment that is his true passion. Today, once again, he has one of his vintage saws with him, a gem from the 80s. This is a 71 cubic centimeter saw with just over five horsepower. What I particularly like about this piece is that it's very reliable, that it runs very smoothly. It's like a reliable colleague. First, he removes the branches to expose the trunk. He then cuts a wedge into the tree. This determines the direction it will fall in. The wedge is now in this direction. That's the direction of movement, and now we want to cut down half of the tree in that direction. At least in theory, one last look to check that the road is really clear. the old oak tree falls as planned. The country road is safe. The team is satisfied. All good, it went exactly as we planned. And that was with the help of an old Swedish saw from the golden 80s. 
back to the timber sports. Shortly before the deciding battle, Dirk Braun caresses his hot saw. My hot saw is my baby. I treat it like my wife. Not quite as good, but almost as good. Engineer Jörg Blasey takes care of competitor Robert Ebner's baby. The hot saw is the Formula One racing car of the timber sports athlete. You see, you pick up 65, 70 horsepower machines, that's the same as a small car, and you have to be fully focused so that you remain in charge of the saw, and the saw doesn't do whatever it wants with you. The saw developed by Jörg Blasey is a very special specimen, even among the hot saws. We're the only ones in the world who work with a Wankel engine with the rotary piston engine as opposed to the reciprocating piston engine. The machine has incredibly low vibrations and is very soft, which makes it easier to control and makes it cut softer and therefore faster in the wood. The technology works. Now, the humans just have to do their bit. I'm just hoping for the best, that I make a quick cut and then we'll just see. It's all up to me now. Robert Ebner's chances are good. The 31-year-old is currently in first place. The last time he was German champion was in 2012, and he was even runner-up in the World Championship in 2010. Just behind him, Dirk Braun. I'm still one point behind Robert. That's not much, but he's also strong in the hot saw. It used to be my specialty. It's going to be really tight because we both have to take a huge risk, and he knows I cut well. And I know he cuts well, so yeah, this is going to be tight. The current hot saw world record was set by Robert Ebner just a few weeks ago, 5.23 seconds. But the reigning German champion, Dirk Braun, has a lot of experience and nerves of steel. Two modern gladiators carrying their chainsaws onto the stage like swords. For both of them, timber sports are a way of life. And the hot saw duel in particular is pure adrenaline. At stand number one, Robert Ebner. At stand number two, local hero Dirk Brown. Maximum concentration is called for. Both athletes want the same thing, to be German champion. Ibna took 7.66 seconds to make the cut, a good two seconds more than the best time. With 5.2 seconds, Dirk Braun is well ahead, making him the German champion for the eighth time. Great record. Good. New German record. World record. World record. World record. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a world record. Robert Ebner should know. After all, he was still the world record holder until a few seconds ago. Thankless second place. Quite clearly a disappointment for the ambitious 31-year-old. Now I've lost my world record and I blew the German championship. This is now the fourth German championship I've blown with the hot saw. I have to go back up. And here he is again, our German champion, Dirk Brown. Local hero Dirk Braun can celebrate his excellent performance today, but he'll be back in training tomorrow because next up is the World Championship and international competitors await.